I think that Performance Max right now is more complex than an appendectomy. Pmax best practices. Yeah, let's do best. Let's call it best practices for now. For now, yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. So that's the disclaimer. And you know, Corey was saying before we started recording, and and I wanted to pair it that no matter what information we put out there, it's more or less going to be antiquated almost immediately. <laughs> if you're just a business trying to run your own Google Ads. I, I used to be less aggressive with this statement. I used to say like, hey, you can figure it out on your own. You just have to be dedicated, consistent, etc." I'm now, I'm 180. I'm like, don't do it. You just can't. Like if you have a limited amount of budget and you're okay with six months of potentially not having great performance, go ahead and add a bunch of asset groups. At least you'll get some data eventually, but that's not everybody. Dude, that was a masterclass. That was amazing. Oh. Yeah, I'm gonna tear that up and put it on Twitter and pretend I thought of all of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
it doesn't matter the buttons you're pushing, you're not gonna be able to know which buttons to push or why something's going bad or how to correct it. So we got to keep that in mind. This isn't just like, where do I go for what? It's it's how do I think about an approach paid search and then think about an omni-channel if you're a business owner, so. Yeah. Dear God, omni-channel, that's a whole rabbit hole. I wish you didn't say that because I just feel so tempted to just dive and be like, <laughs> we're going to talk about this for 20 minutes, but <laughs> no, we're going to no. stay true to the course. <laughs> yes. Uh, on the channel coming soon. We're going to stay true to the course. <laughs> Let's talk PMAX best practices. If you're talking yes. to somebody who's, I, I especially want to talk to those folks that haven't done the dive yet. Like mm -hmm. when you're starting out your opinions, where are you starting? What are you doing? Yeah. What are the guardrails? Yeah, I got it. So I like to, I usually like to say there's in, like, what are the ingredients? Let's talk about the ingredients to make PMAX algorithms suit your needs, your, your business goals, right? I think that's that'll give you the high level and then we'll figure out how we can play with those ingredients to make what we want out of this. So you've got the major levers, budget, bidding strategy. You've got your primary conversion actions or campaign conversion settings. Uh, you've got audience signals, value rules. You're, you're starting to see, I think already, this isn't just set it and forget it. There's a lot right. of little levers here. Value rules, which is audiences, devices, geos, supporting non-PMAX campaigns, right? Customer lists. The list goes on and on. You've got a URL ex exclusions, smart shopping upgrades, customer acquisition campaign settings. There's a lot here. So when we think about, okay, we've got a lot of ingredients. What, where do I prioritize things? That so you just of, nailed the, I, I'm so sorry to interrupt yeah, you. Yeah. So what you just said is so, so important. You just nailed the word, it's ingredients. Ingredients. You have all these ingredients. So it's like we open up the fridge and somebody's like, well, what do I grab first? And the question is, well, what do you want to make? Exactly. You know what I mean? Are we baking a cake or a pizza? Because those are two very different things. Yes. So start with your goal and look at these as ingredients that are geared towards your goal. Some of them are violently important if your goal right. is X. Some of them might not be as important if your goal is Y. Sorry, exactly. continue. And to your point about guardrails, you you got to know your you got to know your industry and you've got to know your internal numbers. If you don't know those things, no consultant in the world is going to be able to give you the right advice. It's just the truth because we have to know how to set up what we know about the, the buttons, if you will, or how these automations work, these algorithms work. We have to know that information in order to give you the right strategy. You can't, there's no, again, one, no one size fits all. So you're yeah. going to have to customize the stuff. So I'd love to talk more about like the most common questions um, that I get, because I think this is where most people watching these videos, they probably have one, if not multiple of these common questions that I get. But let me know how you want to go. Have you ever seen something as pathetic as like an old guy pulling out his paper notebook? This is just, it's just, especially, it's just sad, but this is how I, when I'm, when I'm taking notes, this is the best way that I think. So you mentioned knowing your numbers. Yeah. So here's, here's tangible, actionable item number one. We actually went through an internal survey where John is, um, we're, we're trying to make, we, you know, we went from 20 employees to 80. So it's hard to get everybody pointing in the right direction. So we're doing these two hour trainings every Friday. We're actually publicizing a lot of the snippets. You've seen that on our mm -hmm. YouTube channel. Yep. And John said, here are the most important data points. And to the point that Corey just made, if you don't know these numbers, you're going to have a hard time running Google ads, hiring a consultant, doing anything. Corey, what I'd love to do is I'm going to say what I think they are. Sure. And I'd love for you to add anything that we're missing. Cool. cool. So first is CAC. Yep. What is your cost of acquiring a new customer? And if you don't know that and you're not willing to, to delineate between the two, you're putting Google in ability to just resell your traffic to you, which is really, yes. really dangerous. So CAC, what's your return rate? And return rate, by the way, speaks to the next one, which is lifetime value. Lifetime value. Yep. You know your return rate and, and roughly speaking, the, 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 the um, value of the transaction on return uh, you can figure out your LTV 30, 60, 90, 6, 12, 18 months. You need to know what the lifetime value is because the, the, the odds that you are in a business where you're going to be able to self-liquidate on the front end are very low and they're getting lower as time moves on. Right. So CAC, return rate, lifetime value, um, AOV, yeah. new versus returning kind of plays into CAC. Yeah. Uh, and then we have year over year growth. Is there anything you'd add to that? Anything that I missed that you're like, oh, dude, I've got to know the thing. Well, honestly, yeah, like it's it's kind of the same, but not really is is really you have to identify the obviously your best sellers and you have to identify seasonal products because oh, campaigns like point. this with Pmax do not do good with seasonal products or if you just have fulfillment inventory issues, they probably should not live in a Pmax campaign. You're going to train the algorithm to sell something and then you're going to have to pull that out and have it relearn. Not a, not a good place to be. So if you have those like Christmas only products, don't bundle those into your Pmax campaign. It may sound obvious, but I see it all the time. Uh, so that's a big one. Um, and then like, what's the LTV for your different product groups? Because if your lower AOV products are driving most of your higher, like most of the revenue, most of the LTVs, not just the initial purchase, but all time LTVs, you've got to think about that because that's going to play into the bidding strategy that you choose. 
Whereas are your higher AOV products leading to not even just higher revenue or better profits for some companies, are they leading to better quality customers? That's mm. something people do not talk about enough. Internal resources get spent. There's costs that aren't just in your spreadsheet that you have to account for when you're, when you're talking about the stuff. So those are a few. It's also something that's kind of difficult for a machine learning mechanism to determine. Like <laughs> yeah, you exactly. need a, you need a person, maybe not forever. You know what I mean? Someday yeah. there will be a robot that's super smart and tries to kill us all. But <laughs> until then, like a person has to be like, well, I know that these look to like all things are equal, but mm -hmm. in reality, they're not. Right. Um, what phenomenal points. All right, cool. I keep it. This is, I just never going to stop. I'm not going to apologize anymore. I like when we ping, you keep going. What's next? Yeah, that's it. Cool. Um, so um, a bit, very, very common question that I get is um, number of asset groups. Um, so I'm going to go through, it depends on your daily Seven. budget. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. You're going to have your DSK. Yeah, no. So like your number of asset groups, it really is going to be dependent on your daily budget. Um, last call, Kasim, you're like, what's, a, what's something that we were saying that maybe wasn't the best to say? Um, I remember there was one where you guys said, um, you know, use as many asset groups as you can. It's like build out, you know, 70, we're 80 We're still kind of saying that. Yeah. You're still kind of, and to your point, it's yeah. like, it's asterisk if you have the money to support the asset. <laughs> You're right. There, you have to put the asterisk on it. Yeah. Because yeah. it totally depends on your daily budget. You got a hundred dollars a day and you've got a thousand different product uh, SKUs and there's 20 different product categories and you want to segment those asset groups. Good luck. It's going to take you maybe six months to get any actionable data to really do any optimization efforts. And most companies can't burn cash that long <laughs> before they make a decision on stuff. So there's a big disclaimer on that. Number of assets really depends on your daily budget. Uh, if you are really conservative, if you need to you know, use less than 100, I wouldn't advise it per day, then keep it to maybe one to three. You know, it's not ideal, but you got to just keep those asset groups a lot lower because you got to get data back in order to, to optimize from. So that's Do you just have a big tranches. Thing. Do you have like 100 bucks a day is up to five asset groups, 500 bucks a day is up to 20 asset groups? Like, is there a, a yeah. table we can build here? I, I wish there was. I'm trying like, it really depends so much on AOVs and CPCs. So there's sure. not like a hard and fast rule yet, but I would love, I, would, I wish it was that simple. But. Do I like co-ask the questions that you and I both know can't be answered? Right. Well, if I turn that. it around on you. Yeah, yeah I'm going to be well, greatly yeah. offended if this shows up on LinkedIn though. Of course, like here's the table that shows the asset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, Kasim didn't even know this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then also just your level of risk aversion. That's something like I talk about all the time is like, what, because that determines strategy, whether you're doing it yourself or you're working with an agency or freelancer, you have to determine realistically how much risk are you willing to take? Because the more risk you can take, the faster we can spend to get actionable data to do optimizations with. So you have to also think about that. Like if you have a limited amount of budget and you're okay with six months of potentially not having great performance, go ahead and add a bunch of asset groups. At least you'll get some data eventually, but that's not everybody. Um, right. So it's another piece of that as well. So start small, expand. This is not a glitch. I'm interrupting the video you're watching because I need to remind you that I'm always looking for people to join our team. So if you're passionate about Google Ads and you wanna work with the best Google Ads agency on the planet, please go to solate.com forward slash apply. Speaking of working with the best Google Ads agency on the planet, if you're having trouble with Google Ads and you want professional help, that's what we do. You can go to solate.com, that's S-O-L-8.com to apply for your free, no obligation action plan. And if I've given you any level of value at all, maybe think about giving me a thumbs up and subscribing to our channel. That's how we juice the YouTube algorithm Rhythm so they actually know that I know what I'm talking about. If you have questions, comments, concerns, or confessions, hit me below in the comments. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. You know, what's funny about that six month timeline. You've thrown that out a couple of times. We used to say for years, we would say it takes 90 days to prove concept at 90 days. I can give you a feasible cost per acquisition. Yeah. Our sales narrative now has changed so much to where I'm actually losing clients and losing prospects yeah. because the answer now is, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Like if your industry there's dude, there's been a couple of uh, blue ocean industries where we started running PMAX. Yeah. Google knew exactly where to go, exactly where to go. Mm -hmm. And there was nobody else there. So it's super cheap traffic and the targeting is on point right out of the gate. And right. it just like took off. And, we, and, you know, for us, it's just, we look really smart, but in reality, we're in the back, you know, in the front of the client, we're like, yes, this was a very successful campaign. And then yeah. the back, we're like high-fiving and popping shit. We didn't know that was going to happen. You know what right. I mean? And exactly. then sometimes there's a product where you're like, God, this is so linear. This is mm -hmm. a no brainer. I'm going to knock this out of the park. And then you start to run and it's just like this, this slow, you feel like you're climbing a muddy hill and you're having a hard time making it happen. It's yeah. super expensive from a traffic perspective. So like, it's, it's just, I, man, I just don't know. Yeah. Do you have a, do you have a timeline? Like, what do you say to your customers, new yeah. customer wants to run PMAX? How long is this going to take Corey? 
Uh, you know, it's going to vary. Sometimes it takes off right away. If there's a lot of like historical data in the account for the conversion action, that's going to be the primary. If not, if it's a brand new account. Just know what you're getting into. Have you ever done commercial ads before? Like it's, yeah. it's, it's a lot better than that, but it's going to take, I usually set the time of three to six months before there's a lot of variants. Of course, I'm trying to avoid all of the, it depends annoying stuff, but truly it does depend. And I mean, some uh, buyer journeys are going to take like for higher AOV products and take a while. In that case, I'm going to lean more to the six month side because we're going to have to, it's going to take a while. And if the conversion volume is low, it's going to take a while. Uh, if there's a lot of historical data in the account, uh, Google recognizes the, there's a lot of volume behind the industry and the searches. It might be able to take off pretty quickly. I wouldn't mm. set that expectation, but I'd say at least three to six months. And in some cases, that's, I actually will say like, it's three months just to figure out if this is going to be a viable option for us in Google ads. Right. Dude, so that's, that's a hard sell. Same thing. Here's what I, yeah. I give people a visual. I'm like, look in three months, I can show you if the trend lines kind of pointed that way or kind of pointed that way. And that's about what I can do in three months is like, Hey, does this look promising or does it not? But I, there's no, we're not going to be in the black. You're not going to, anyway, I had a, I had a friend, he's in a mastermind with me. Hopefully he never watches this video. Uh, he comes to me and he's like, Hey man, I want you to run all the Google ads. They had a big, big, big spend, uh, B2B company, 18 month sales cycle. Mm -hmm. He goes, but we need proof of concept in 90 days. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, how, how, like, I don't have a time machine. You know what I mean? Like in what world? I mean, I need 18 months in a day. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it, but it's one of those things where everybody looks at advertising like, oh, we need to know whether or not it works now, right away. Right. Yep. And in my mind, I'm like, if I knew that I would be so wealthy. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'd be, I wouldn't be selling services to you. I'd be buying other people's businesses and then yeah. using my magic wand on them. Yeah. Um, I know that came across as really petulant. All right, man, <laughs> keep going. Best practice. I know you've got a little list in front of you. What, what are we? Yeah, no worries. Um, so number of basically, how do I segment my asset groups? Super common. Um, generally speaking, you're seeing this kind of across the board is product category themes, except for combos, which we can get into like combo audiences where you're, uh, you're not segmenting by product category just to run that as a test, but we can get into that at a different video. Um, well-known, uh, if it's not that, if it's more like you notice in buying behavior in your search terms in the past or in other channels that you advertise on, that most people that convert or buy something are searching for brands. So like brand heavy is really what I'm talking about. In that case, you might want to consider instead of product category, uh, if that doesn't really fit and it's mostly brands like, you know, Nike, Adidas, whatever, probably want to segment your asset groups by brand and then go from there. So. That's a you said easier. so much, dude, there's so much value there. I want to unpack it a little bit. And I'm going to go backwards because that's just recency bias. You're not talking about company brand for our listeners and viewers. No. You're, you're talking about product specific brand, depending on what you're selling. If people are looking for that brand, maybe even competitive alternatives. Am I reaching? Yeah, you could test that as a signal for sure. Yeah, like competitors by itself. Yep. But as far as like brands that you yourself offer is what I'm talking about, really. Yep. Um, not as an audience signal. Yeah. So well-known high search brand stuff that you sell. So Nike, Adidas, whatever, separate those by asset groups, just because you're going to see a lot of different buying behavior between those. You're going to want to test those things against each other. So. Do you take drop shippers as clients? Nope. Me neither. Nope. Just denied one yesterday. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, I'm used to. Smart shopping actually made it work pretty well, but it's just, True. it's impossible. Yeah. It's freaking impossible. Oh, yeah. Um, and then next, because I know we're, we're short on time, so I'm going to try to get through this uh, pretty fast. Uh, audience signals to use. That's another big one. Um, so the ones I like the most that tend to work across most accounts, different sizes, uh, DSK is your display search keywords, mostly uh, most of the time previous converting keywords. But if we got a lot of budget, I love to throw in like a giant like 6,000 you know, keyword list of just every synonym for like buy, sale, promo, plus the product name or product category and throw that in and wait 10 minutes for Google to accept it. And then use that as a uh, custom segment for um, purchase intention or recently searched. That's, so right. anyway, that's a whole thing, but you have a fun um, little Google sheet that has all the terms that you like to use. And then you just fill it out and it punches them out. Yep. It takes yep. a lot of work, but man, I get great results in that because you're just, uh, you're cherry picking all the potential high intent searches. Yeah. Even if they haven't converted in the past. Um, first party data, um, this is optional. Sometimes you only want to feed it first, um, non first party data if you want to make the algorithm work a little bit harder, um, which can make sense for some people, uh, less sense for agencies because you have to try to prove concept in three to six months, as we've discussed. But if you're a business owner and you're a little less risk averse and you're willing to make that algorithm work really hard for scalability long term, 
maybe consider skipping the first party data, just give it cold audience signals. It's gonna expand outside of those initial um, audience signals anyway, but it can be a, a strategy for some. So if you do do first party data, customers, subscribers, app users, if that's relevant for you, site visitors, um, a YouTube uh, channel uh, viewers, those are all uh, pretty decent options. Yeah, we don't use it at all as a rule because in our experience, I'm actually just parroting what John says. It, it, it limits, like Google just stays. It feels like it yeah. limits the learning on a pretty significant scale. It does, level. and it takes a while for it to start going outside of that is right. what I've seen too, sometimes months, like three to six months. So so DSK is first party data if you want to do that. Um, in markets, relevant. Uh, try not to go too crazy with that. Um, you can really throw it off. And from what I can tell, once Pmax kind of figures out a signal, I know Google doesn't say this is true, but it seems to be that once you sort of teach it a certain audience to go after, doesn't seem to forget that information. So just take that as you may. So DSKs, first party data in markets that are relevant. And then you can also just get creative as you have more budget, as you're looking for scale opportunities, other audiences, like a high share of conversion from the insights tab. You're going to see that high share of conversions, you know, 70% in some cases, 80% in some cases. I do notice that Google leans to affinity audiences for that though. So just be careful because those are very large audiences. Even if they seem somewhat relevant and they're getting a ton of conversions, just be careful and cautious with uh, throwing those as an audience signal because that's that's pretty broad. Mm. Um, and then lastly, would just be high conversion probability users. It's kind of like a, an interesting trick. Uh, some people have a beta in their Google Analytics. There is a, a, a custom audience that's called high conversion probability users. And you can actually use that and test that as an audience signal as well. It's pretty interesting. Um, so those are some audiences signals that I usually use the most, at least to start. Dude, that was a masterclass. That was amazing. Cool. Yeah, I'm uh, going to tear that up and put it on Twitter and pretend I thought of all of it. Yeah, <laughs> all good, all good. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so I'd say next would be like initial budget to set. Um, that's a big one. I think everybody kind of knows it's going to vary a lot, but at least 100 bucks a day. I don't spend too much time on that. But if you were spending, uh, another way to look at it is if you were spending, you know, $200 a day on smart shopping and maybe the rest of your budget was allocated to other inbound, uh, outbound strategies, maybe another 30%, maybe 2X. Again, there's no perfect number here. Try to give it as much as you can, understanding it's a giant ship of a campaign. It's six to seven uh, different campaigns in one. So just consider that when you're going into it. And you're all um, in one PMX campaign, right? You're not splitting out initially. Uh, as much as I can. Yeah, there's some weird use, use cases to have to do separately, but I don't like doing that for the cross pollination of products. And, and you have to make a lot of assumptions in doing that. I'm hearing a lot of best practices of like separating by margin. This is not smart shopping. Like we have to be careful about those assumptions. People don't buy because of your margin, right? So some people are going to buy those lower tier products and become the best customers, the highest TV customers. When you start segmenting like that, if one can, one of those campaigns has more budget than the other, guess who's going to get the priority? Probably the one yeah. with the higher budget. So you just have to be careful about over, over segmenting in today's, you know, fully automated world. Of I've had some bloody nerd wars on that because there's yeah. some, and I think this has more to do with agency trying to justify their existence. There's, I've sure. opened up campaigns and it's just like, I mean, it's masterfully built. It's really yeah. impressive, but you look yeah. at it and you're like, wow, this isn't going to work. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I still like the set of like my um, country, if language is super important, none of the obvious ones they are like campaign level stuff. Um, countries I like to separate um, languages, if that again, makes sense. But generally speaking, I don't do that. Uh, there are some cases which we can get into like with bidding strategies, where if you're trying to um, promote a product that is not getting any love from the Pmax campaign it's in, you could always consider segmenting that one out and using a certain bid strategy. So that's a whole topic on its own, but those are some segment uh, opportunities there if you want to do that. But I try to keep it consolidated if possible. Yeah, I'm yeah. almost, I'm, th there's a rabbit hole here that I want to, there's a whole nother video for us yeah. to talk about the, the segmentation capability with Pmax post proof of concept. Yes. Because I actually think that that's where, I mean, there's a ton of value in starting to figure out how I'm going to pull this out and where I'm going to push and mm -hmm. uh, how to meander Pmax. Um, right. But I'll stay on topic, Corey. Well, let's, let's do that for a bit though. I mean, as far as, uh, let's talk about like it's bid, bidding strategy because that's always a big one too. You know, yep. should I use max conversion value? Should I use max conversions? Well, this person said this, should I always use that? And it's like, hold on again. Let's talk about your business. Let's talk about those internal metrics. So I'm going to try to um, keep this simple, but there is some, some variance here. So max conversions, if your AOVs do not vary much, like they're not all over the place. You don't have thousand dollars and you know $20 products um, and you want to keep those PMAX campaigns together, which again, I'd suggest that 
those AOVs don't very much, or the higher LTVs or like your best customers come from those lower tier AOV products. Keep it on, you can, you, I would test max conversions in that case. Now this is not, it's not gonna be most people or everybody. So it's more of a secondary option. Primarily I'll use the max conversion values. Now that's mostly, you gotta consider if your LTV really doesn't apply because there's like no repeat purchasers um, or like higher tier AOV products like generate, uh, generate the most LTVs um, and you wanna keep conversion volume high um, cause, cause if Google, this is the whole thing. So if Google prioritizes those higher AOV products, um, it's, it's going to be hard for you to, to break out of that and force it somewhere else. So there's a lot of little discrepancies. So to try to summarize that if your AOVs don't very much, or your L, your higher LTV customers, um, come from those lower tier AOV products, max conversions is a great start. You can always change it later if you need to max conversion value best for most companies if LTV doesn't apply, because it's just kind of one and done people, um, or you um, you notice that the best customers, the highest LTVs come from a kind of variety of products or those higher AOV uh, products. So it's- Can you it's, bully it's max conversion value with offline conversion tracking? Is there, is yeah, there that, any impact? Like, you know, I have the GCLID, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm already optimizing yeah. by conversion value on the front end, and then I'm just feeding you more and more information. Yes, that is the trick. So if you if you can have that set up for you to have it where there's conversion value adjustments is what you're talking about. Yeah, because then you can show Google that these products don't just lead to twenty dollars; they actually lead to two thousand, right? And then it can make sure to prioritize that. Yeah, so that's a really good point. But the GCLIB's only is it ninety days? Or is it six months? It atrophies, uh, right? It dies. I want to say 90 days, but yeah, it could be, be 180. Well, yeah, um, changes too. That's the problem is Google's just like, oh, yeah, surprise. Um, how long we're used to that though. <laughs> um, dude, I'm so sorry I have to cut this short. Yeah, no worries. One of the smartest guys in the whole wide world. I really appreciate it. Last <laughs> words you. to you. If people want to follow you, see you, where do they go? Yeah, uh, check out my LinkedIn. I post there at least once a week. I try to pack as much value in there as possible. Um, yeah, and then uh, I'll, I'll be on a, a follow-up video, so hopefully with Kasim. We'll get into some more of the, the nerdy uh, in the weeds stuff that a lot of you guys like and hope you got a lot of uh, value out of the video. You're the man, Corey. If you're watching, like, comment, subscribe, go follow Corey. He does consulting, by the way. If you've ever tried to reach out to us for consulting, we batter you away. Corey does it. Um, so go bug him and uh, <laughs> we'll see y'all next time. Hello and welcome to your daily Google News. I'm Kasim and this is Corey. Corey, how do I say your last name? Lindholm? Lindholm. It's, uh, it's Swedish. Yep. Awesome. Have you been to Switzerland? Not yet. I'm actually going in September, though. All right, dude, my wife and I, are, we were going to go and COVID killed the dream. What are you going for? <laughs>